All right, in today's video, we're looking at electrolysis. Um, this happens in electrolytic cells, a special type of electrochemical cell. You recall that electrolysis is where we have a non-spontaneous redox reaction. Non-spontaneous means its equilibrium constant is very small, much, much, much smaller than one. Um, it means that the cell potential is negative. Negative cell potentials are non-spontaneous redox reactions. So we have this non-spontaneous redox reaction that we're going to force to happen. Because its equilibrium constant is so small, it doesn't want to make products, but we're going to force it to make products using electrolysis. We're going to run a direct current, electricity, through, this, through a solution or through a molten um, salt, and from that electricity, we're going to generate products. We're going to force the reaction to produce products. There are three broad types of electrolysis that we need to be, that we need to be aware of. The first is perhaps the easiest. It's the electrolysis of molten salts. And the word molten, you might note for yourself, means melted. So imagine you have a container here, this little dish. It's being blasted with a Bunsen burner and it was filled with lead bromide, lead 2 bromide. Lead 2 bromide has a chemical formula PBBr2. Now the word molten means it was filled with solid lead bromide, but as we heated it, it melted. So there are Pb2 plus ions, Pb2 plus cations, and there are Br negative anions floating around in this liquid salt. Okay? Because it's liquid, it's able to conduct electricity. These ions are free to move. So as a liquid, the salt is an electrolyte. It can conduct electricity. At the top here, we see a schematic representation of a battery. Okay, that represents a battery. A battery also a, known as a voltaic or a galvanic cell. In this particular schematic diagram, um, the, a, a long vertical line represents the positive terminal of a battery. The small little vertical line beside it is the negative terminal of a battery. So this particular schematic has one, two, three, four cells connected together. This small dash at the end means this is the negative terminal of the battery, and the long dash over here means this is the positive terminal of the battery. And those are the labels on the outside of the battery that a physics person would have labeled. This particular diagram has a switch as well, and right now the switch is open, but let's pretend that it's a closed switch. So from the negative terminal of the battery up at the top, we know that electrons are going to come out. That's why the battery's terminal is labeled negative, because it's a source of electrons. We know that electrons are going to flow back to the positive terminal of the battery. As these electrons leave the negative terminal, they're going to flow into this um, electrode. These two electrodes are inert electrodes, okay, so they don't chemically react. They would also have to be pretty high melting points because we're dipping them in this molten, this melted lead bromide salt. Good choices of inert electrodes would be things like platinum metal or sometimes a nickel chromium alloy. And sometimes even just carbon or graphite rods are used as inert electrodes. So that electrode has electrons coming out of the battery flowing into that electrode. So that electrode is also negatively charged. And so the electrode, we could write a bunch of negative charges on the electrode. The electrons leaving on the other side means that the second electrode has positive charge on it, and it's labeled positive also. Okay. So now, remember, in the dish, there were lead cations and there are bromide anions. The electrode on the, on the right-hand side is negatively charged. So bromide ions, which are negative, are going to be repelled by that electrode, while lead cations, which are positive, would be attracted to it. So the cations are being pulled to this negatively charged electrode. You remember that cations are pulled towards the cathode. So this electrode, which attracts the cations, is your cathode. Reduction occurs at the cathode. 
So those lead cations will go towards the cathode, and when they collide with it, they're going to pick up, they're going to gain the electrons that are flowing in there. So reduction is going to happen. At the other electrode, the negatively charged bromide will be attracted to that positively charged electrode. Opposite charges attract. Bromide ions are anions. So the other electrode is attracting anions. So that is your anode. And oxidation happens there. So the bromide ions will collide with that electrode. They will get oxidized, losing their electrons, which will leave and flow towards the battery, completing the circuit. So that's what's going on in the picture. Let's now write the balanced equations for the anode, the cathode, and overall. Well, the anode we know is oxidation. And we know that those anions, the bromide ions, are being pulled towards the anode. So bromide is going to become oxidized. Now you should be able to reason out what the products would be. If bromide loses electrons, it's going to become neutral bromine. And bromine is one of our Hofbrinkel diatomic elements. So Br2 would be the product. To balance this, we need two bromides and we're going to lose two electrons in the process. Now, if you have a hard time doing what I just did, you can use your standard reduction potentials chart as an aid. If you find bromide ions, here we are, they're going to be oxidized at the anode. So we're going to write this equation backwards, the oxidation reaction. Bromide becomes bromine and loses two electrons. The cathode attracts our cations, so Pb2 plus goes to the cathode. Reduction occurs, and reduction is gaining of electrons, so we're going to gain two electrons because its charge was two positive, and it's going to become lead metal. And again, if you have a hard time figuring that out, you can look at the chart and find Pb2 plus being reduced, gaining electrons, it forms lead metal. Both of these equations have two electrons being lost and being gained here. So when we combine the two reactions for the overall reaction, we don't need to multiply any of them by a coefficient. So overall, we have lead cations reacting with bromide anions, and that's forming bromine, or I guess lead will do first, and bromine Br2. So at the cathode, lead metal is being produced, and at the anode, bromine is being produced. The bromine at the temperature in which the salt was melted, the bromine would likely be a gas. The lead at that temperature, I'm not exactly sure, probably a solid, but it's possible that the melting point has been exceeded and it would also be a liquid. So there, there we have it. The electrolysis is a molten salt. It's relatively easy because a salt is made of just a cation and an anion. The cation will go to the cathode where it's reduced and the anion will go to the anode where it is oxidized. That's the simple picture. So see if you can repeat what we just did with this picture. This time we have molten zinc chloride in this dish. We have two electrodes and we have a battery. So this is another example of an electrolytic cell. That we're again doing a molten salt, molten zinc chloride. Zinc chloride's formula is ZnCl2. All right, see if you can label the batter, the electrolytic cell rather the way we did above and see if you can also figure out the reactions at the anode and cathode, what's being produced there, and what the overall reaction would be. So zinc chloride is made of Zn2 plus cations and Cl minus anions. So in this dish, you have Zn2 plus and you have Cl minus floating around. Looking at our battery up at the top here, for an electrolytic cell, we need to have a battery in, in the picture. The negative terminal is on the left, and the positive terminal is on the right. So out of the battery's negative terminal, the electrons are flowing. 
into the electrode on the left, so the electrode on the left will become negatively charged, negative, 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 on that electrode. The electrode on the right is losing electrons as they fly back to the battery, and so as it loses electrons, it becomes positively charged at the electrode on the right. The cations are positive, they're going to be pulled towards the electrode on the left, which was negative, so that's our cathode attracting the cations. The negative chloride ion will be pulled towards the electrode on the right, which was positively charged. An electrode that attracts anions is the anode. We know that oxidation occurs at the anode. We know reduction occurs at the cathode. So the reaction at the anode the anion, the chloride ion, is going to be oxidized. It's going to lose electrons. You can reason it out, or you can look at your data booklet reduction potentials chart. It's going to form chlorine. Two chlorides form one Cl2, and to balance charge, we lose two electrons in the process. So there's the oxidation reaction chlorine gas is forming at the anode. The cathode will attract the cation, so Zn2+, which will get reduced, it will gain electrons, and that will form zinc metal. So zinc metal is forming at the cathode, while chlorine gas is bubbling out at the anode. The overall reaction, again, we don't have to multiply either one of these because they each have two electrons. So we're going to end up with Zn2 plus with two chloride ions makes Zn and Cl2 as our overall reaction. Okay, so electrolytic cells involving molten salts, relatively straightforward. The salt has just an, a cation and an anion. The cation goes to the cathode and gets reduced. The anion goes to the anode and gets oxidized. The second type of electrolysis is the electrolysis of water, pure water. Okay? So we have a different looking picture here, but it's the same idea. We have a beaker full of water, and we've got two inert electrodes. Again, that could be platinum, that could be graphite, um, and it's attached to a power source, a battery of some type that provides direct current DC. The, ne the negative terminal is on the right, the positive terminal is on the left in this picture. So that means the electrons are flowing in this direction in this picture. And so the electrons flow into this electrode, which will make a negative. Something is going to gain those electrons, so this is where reduction is going to occur. And that means it's the cathode. The electrons are leaving from the other electrode, so it becomes positive. Being positive, it will attract the anions. That is my anode, and oxidation will occur there. Now, what is actually in this beaker? We know this is just electrolysis of water. So a moment ago, I used the term anions towards the anode, and that is generally true. But in this situation, there are no anions. There's just water in the beaker. So I'm going to draw two water molecules. Water is HOH, so I'll draw two molecules here. And you remember that water molecules are polar. The bonds are polar. Oxygen is very electronegative. So in a water molecule, the oxygen is partially negative, while the hydrogen is partially positive. Okay? I'm not sure if you can tell, but I'm just using the Greek letter delta negative to indicate partial negative and delta positive to indicate partial positive charge. So the water molecule, again, the oxygens are partially negative, the hydrogens are partially positive because it's a polar molecule. Now can you see what's about to happen? Because water has a negative and a positive side to it, water will be attracted to both of these electrodes. To the electrode on the left with its positive charges, the negatively charged oxygens in water will be pulled towards there. And the electrode on the right, with its negative charges, the positively charged hydrogens in water will be attracted there. 
So water is being pulled to the anode, so water will be oxidized at the anode. Water is being pulled to the cathode, so water will be reduced at the cathode. We look at our reduction chart, and we're going to find two reactions, one where water is being reduced and one where water is being oxidized. So here, negative 0.83 volts, water gains electrons to make hydrogen gas and hydroxide ions. So there's water being reduced. So let's copy that equation down for the cathode. So just copying it right off the chart, two water molecules gain two electrons and become hydrogen gas and two hydroxide ions. So notice hydrogen gas is being produced when water gets reduced. Hydrogen will be produced at the cathode in this reaction. The anode reaction is an oxidation equation. So we're going to find a reaction where water is being oxidized. On our chart, things being oxidized are on the right-hand side. They're reducing agents, right? We read the equations backwards, and we say that water right here is being oxidized, and it forms oxygen gas. Now water, if you look a little bit further above, water can also be oxidized and form hydrogen peroxide. But of those two reactions, if you consider what their oxidation potentials are, remember an oxidation potential is the reverse sign of the reduction potential. So water forming oxygen has an oxidation potential of negative 1.23 while water forming hydrogen peroxide has an oxidation potential of negative 1.78. So the one with the higher potential is water forming oxygen. So that's going to be the reaction that happens here. So just copy that directly off your chart. Two water molecules will be oxidized. They're going to form oxygen gas, four hydrogen ions, and four electrons. So at the anode, oxygen gas will be produced. It's pretty easy to remember because oxygen is being formed when water is oxidized. And then you just remember the other product from water's electrolysis is hydrogen, so the hydrogen forms when water is reduced, which is the only other possibility. We're going to combine the two half reactions to get the overall reaction, but we notice that in the second equation, we're only gaining two electrons, while in the first we were losing four. So to combine them, I'm going to double the second equation. When I do that, I get four plus two, I get six water molecules, and then they will form oxygen with two hydrogens, and then I'm also going to get four hydrogen ions and four hydroxide ions. That's a pretty complicated looking reaction. But notice four hydrogens and four hydroxides on the right. That's going to combine together to give me four water molecules. So now we have six waters on the left and four waters on the right. I can cancel out the smaller number from both sides, and I'll end up with two water molecules forming oxygen and two hydrogens. There's the a classic way to represent the electrolysis of water as an overall reaction. Oxygen is produced at your anode, and hydrogen is produced at your cathode. Notice that the 2 to 1 ratio means you'll end up getting twice as much hydrogen as oxygen gas. Now you may have seen a picture like this for electrolysis of water. This weird looking equipment is called the Hoffman apparatus. And the way it's designed is that the two electrodes are down here, and the negative terminal is connect on the battery is connected here. So the electrons are flowing through, water is being reduced on this side, and you get hydrogen gas bubbling up, and it's being collected here by water displacement. Over here, the positive terminal, oxygen is being produced as oxidation occurs, and the oxygen bubbles up, and you get it collected over here by water displacement. These are like two burettes that are upside down. They have stopcocks. You could open up the stopcock and release some hydrogen or release some oxygen if you wanted to. 
Um, now, one thing to note about electrolysis of water, remember that pure water doesn't have very many ions in it. The self-ionization of water occurs, you have 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molar hydronium, that's why water's pH is 7 at 25 degrees, and you'd have 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molar hydroxide ions as well. Very, very little ions are present in pure water. As a result, pure water is not a very good conductor of electricity. Pure water is not a good electrolyte. So if you wanted to do the electrolysis of water, you'd have a small problem. The electricity would not flow well between the two electrodes because water does not conduct electricity well. So what you'd have to do is you'd have to add a salt to the water, add a salt or perhaps an acid that would help it conduct electricity. The salt or the acid would produce ions. The ions would conduct electricity as they moved through the water. Common choices for ion for a salt might be something like sodium sulfate, which is commonly used in the electrolysis of water. The, the salt you use, though, has to be carefully selected because if we're going to see in a moment salt in water. There's, that's our third type of electrolysis, and we, in this situation, we want to add a salt to the water that will not interfere with water being oxidized or water being reduced. We're going to see in a moment how that might happen. So the third type of electrolysis, the final type, is electrolysis of an aqueous salt solution. So now we have salt, but it's dissolved in water, and you can see in the picture AQ beside the KBR means aqueous, and that means there's water present. So again, we have this picture with a negative terminal on the right, so the electrons are flowing into this electrode. They're flowing back towards this terminal of the battery, so this terminal on the right, the, sorry, the electrode on the right, will become negatively charged. The one on the left will be positively charged. The negatively charged terminal where electrons are coming in will be the site of reduction. The electrons are going to be gained there. Um, and so this is the cathode. The electrons are leaving from the other electrodes, so that is oxidation. Electrons are being lost, and that will mean that's our anode. Now in this situation, we have potassium bromide dissolved in water. So there are really three types of particles in this liquid. We have K positive cations, we have Br negative anions, and we have water molecules. Okay? Now, the cathode, the negatively charged terminal, will attract the cation, so potassium is going to be pulled towards the cathode, where potassium may be reduced. On the other hand, water molecules are also attracted to the cathode, so water may also be reduced. So let's go over to our cathode and write down both possible reactions. So on the one hand, K positive ions may gain electrons and become potassium metal, or water, I'm going to just copy the equation again from my chart, two water molecules could gain two electrons, and that would form hydrogen gas and also hydroxide ions. Now, which of those reactions is actually going to occur? To figure that out, let's write down the voltage for each reaction, the potential. Water being reduced has a potential here of negative 0.83 volts, while the potassium being reduced down here at the bottom is negative 2.92 volts. So if I write down the voltages beside these, the first one for potassium was negative 2.92 volts. And for water's reduction, its potential, oops, its potential is negative 0.83 volts. So we're going to decide which half reaction actually occurs at the cathode. And the answer is whichever one's potential was greater. So in this case, water's potential is greater than the potassium potential. Negative 0.83 is a bigger number than negative 2.92. So that means at that cathode, sorry, over here at the cathode, 
the potassium ions will, will not be reduced. Water would be reduced, and we're going to see hydrogen gas bubble off of that electrode. Now, what about the anode reaction? Well, the anode, again, has two possible reactions. The bromide ions could be oxidized, in which case they would form bromine and lose two electrons. Or water could also be oxidized, and in that case, writing the equation again from my chart, two water molecules being oxidized would form uh, oxygen gas, four hydrogen ions, and four electrons, so water being oxidized. Write down the potential for each, the potential for bromide's oxidation, we want its oxidation potential, is negative 1.09 volts. Okay, make sure you're looking at your chart for this and not just copying me. The water being oxidized has a potential of negative 1.23 volts. So by the same logic we had a minute ago, the larger potential, this one's a little bit closer, but the larger potential belongs to the bromine. Negative 1.09 is a little bit bigger than negative 1.23. So at the anode, we're going to see bromine forming. And at the cathode, we're going to see hydrogen gas forming. So a bubbling of, bro of uh, hydrogen and probably a bubbling of bromine as well, although it may end up being bromine um, dissolved in the water. So there's the two half reactions. And overall, we get uh, let's see, two electrons, two electrons. So two bromide ions with two waters forms bromine hydrogen, and two hydroxide ions. There's the overall reaction. Notice that because hydroxide ions are being produced, the pH of inside the beaker will rise during the electrolysis. All right, see if you can do the same sort of thing over here. We have copper sulfate being electrolyzed, an aqueous solution. So again, it's dissolved in water. So you should have noticed the electrons coming out of the negative terminal of that battery. This electrode becomes negatively charged. It's my cathode where reduction will happen. Somebody's going to come pick up those electrons. And the other electrode electrons are leaving. So it's going to become positively charged. It'll attract the anions. This is the anode where oxidation will happen. In the beaker, we have copper 2 plus cations, we have sulfate 2 minus anions, and we have water. Water will be pulled in both directions because it's polar. It'll go towards each electrode. The cations copper will go to the cathode while the anion sulfate will go to the anode. So now, what reactions will happen? Well, at our anode, we have sulfates and we have waters. So let's take a look at our chart. We know already that water can be oxidized. So here we are, water being oxidized. But I don't see any reaction on this chart with sulfate being oxidized. Um, and that's because sulfur in sulfate is already very highly oxidized. It's got four oxygens attached. Although there probably is a reaction where sulfate gets oxidized, its potential would be very small because it's already highly oxidized. So for this one, we don't have a sulfate ion on the chart, but we're going to reason that sulfate's oxidation potential would be very small because it's already highly oxidized. So therefore, we're going to guess that the water gets oxidized instead, and so the half reaction at the anode will be the same one that we, oh, sorry, it won't be exactly the same, but it'll be the water forming oxygen gas and hydrogen ions and electrons. Now, what about the cathode? Well, the cathode is going to attract the copper cations, and it'll also attract the water. 
So we look at our chart and we want to find reduction reactions. Copper being reduced, positive 0.34 volts, and water being reduced, negative 0.83 volts. Of those two, the copper has the higher reduction potential. So of the two possible reactions, copper will be the reduction reaction. Its potential was higher. So copper 2 plus gains two electrons to make copper metal. The overall reaction, two electrons, four electrons, will need to double the copper equation. So we have two water molecules, two copper cations forming two coppers, oxygens, and four hydrogen ions. So we're going to see copper metal at the cathode. We're going to see oxygen gas bubbling out of the anode in this particular situation. So we've just looked at three different types of electrolysis. The electrolysis of a molten salt, only a cation and an anion. The cation will get um, will get reduced at the cathode, the anion will get oxidized at the anode. The second type was water being electrolyzed. Water gets pulled to each electrode and water will be oxidized at the anode to make oxygen. Water will be reduced at the cathode to make hydrogen. The third situation was the more complicated one, the electrolysis of an aqueous salt solution. It was more complicated because at each electrode there were two possible reactions. We chose the reaction with the higher um, potential in each case. So at the anode, the reaction with the higher oxidation potential won out, and at the cathode, the reaction with the higher reduction potential won out. So that one's a little bit harder um, to predict. In our next uh, video on electrolysis, we're going to go from being qualitative like this, just describing things, to being quantitative. We're going to ask things like how many grams of potassium will form, how many, how many liters of hydrogen would form, things like that, given a certain electric current operating for a certain time. So that's in our next video where we become more mathematical and quantitative.